Hi there everyone, I'm here with Louisiane from the Royal Society Library and today we're talking about paper, but not just books, we're talking about paper instruments? Instruments made out of paper, just like it says on the tin. Alright, well you're going to have to show me that. Yeah. What, have we, what have we got? We've got all sorts of things, but we're going to start with this little book here. Yeah, it's a baby one and it doesn't look like much, especially because it's in a new binding, just a library binding, but this is one of our oldest books. So you can see on the spine here, 1473. 1473! That's right, that's I didn't right. know there were books that old. It's called an almanac and in some ways this is exactly what you see. You see just the months and you see different zodiac signs and different signs in the margin and so you have the printing press which is used for the text here and mm. the columns but you can see already that it's hand coloured at the top. There's a little fancy K here and there's a little sign here. These have been hand drawn on the printed stuff. That's right, that's right. And you have different columns giving you the sun and the moon, and it's actually an almanac giving you what day of the month it is and giving some sort of markers to actually know what's happening with crops. So it's just for general use to know how the year is moving. So this is by a German scientist, if you want to call him that. He is one of the earliest to design astronomical books. It seems obvious to have a calendar today, but actually it was quite difficult for people to mark time in the Middle Ages, and this is what it does. It is a science to actually uh, put a calendar together. No, so these are clearly um, star signs, aren't they? Scorpio. Come on, where's Gemini? That's me. Libra. That's Libra. That's the yeah. Virgo. There ah, he is. There we go. There's the Gemini. They're look funny looking, aren't they? Damn. And uh, that's Gemini in, uh, in old German. So it's halfway in German, halfway in, in Latin, I should say. But so I've picked this book not so much for the calendar, but for something you've already seen. And just to put it in context, which is all of the paper instruments that Regio Montanus, the author, adds to his calendar. This is the intention. It's to actually be able to cut your instruments and then turning the quadrant so that you can actually find where you are in time. Look at the cute little face on the moon as well. I know, we'll see quite a few cute little faces. Yeah. They're like the cute little, little faces in the Middle Ages. Oh, and look at these too. These are great. These are like obviously what phases of the moon. Phases of the moon. Yeah. Some more pretty faces and more funny faces. The moon doesn't look that happy there. He looks kind of a bit dopey and dozy there. There yeah. he looks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He looks kind of. I don't know. He can't decide what he's thinking there. I quite like this one where you can only see its mouth. <laughs> I really like this, first of all, because you can see how vibrant the colours still are. Yeah. Oh, we're talking about 1471. But those are scientific instruments. A quadrant is still used, you know, as a scientific instrument. So if you had um, a cut-out version of this, you, you wouldn't, you know, put it in a box. It's something that gets misled really easily, that gets lost and get, that gets destroyed very easily. So where you would have quadrants made out of um, wood or metals, those would have lasted much more. Whereas the paper ones, they're just gone. Clearly the person who owned this book didn't cut out the instrument. That's right, that's right. So Louisiane, does that mean possibly there are a whole bunch of these in collections around the world that have Holes in them or pages missing? Now, I'm glad you asked that. Oh. Let's have a look at the next one. I promise that wasn't set up. <laughs> that was just my journalistic instinct. <laughs> it wasn't, it's true. So the second book I have is ever so slightly later. It's 1521. Wow. So it's not in Incunabula, but it's still very early. And this is by so the second generation of printers, someone called Schooner who is a printer as well as someone who does astronomy. So it's very similar to the one you looked at. Um, and he actually was a student of uh, Regio Montanus, the first author. I really like this one because it's missing out a lot of pieces. Great title it's page. A beautiful title page. He also forgot to put his name. How cute is that? Well, and someone else yeah, wrote it Yeah, someone else wrote it there. It doesn't <laughs> have his name on it. So it's just written out of a uh, pencil. This is actually meant to track the movements of the planets. So the idea being that you can actually use the paper instruments and track the planets yourself. There is a thread yeah. right here. There's mm. another one actually that's mm. fallen out there. And this was meant to have a disc on top and you would shift the disc. It's missing basically the whole Volvel here, but you can still see the bits of tacky glue that was used there. This is actually wax and they used wax to fix the disc. But we still have a disc ah. on this one. I mean, the fact that it's from 1521, you wouldn't say, it just looks pristine. It mm. just looks in, in such a, a good condition for the age. And unfortunately, it's not fixed on the page itself, but I can still delicately turn the top one. Mm. This one turns as well. Fantastic. 
and that's oh, the last one. Look at that. I have no idea what that is, but it looks amazing. Well, I have to be honest, I'm not sure what it is either. Okay. I've been scratching my head looking at it, and uh, I hope that someone can help us with this one. Leave a comment. Yeah, She'll read them. She'll read the comments. I will read them. So yeah, it's, it looks like it's some kind of diagram, but I can't quite make sense of it because it's got graduation going from five back to four. I'm, I'm not sure what that means. All right. Please help. All right, so what do we got next? So next, we're going to jump a few centuries and we're going to go at the Royal Society with good old Robert Hooke. Robert Hooke? Yes, All right. Robert Hooke. There you go, so that's a two-part one. This is the Philosophical Collections, which is the journal edited by Robert Hooke in between the Philosophical Transactions. So he takes over the Philosophical Transactions, the journal of the Royal Society, um, and gives it his own name just because he wants to be different. And so he calls it Philosophical Collections. This volume is all of the Philosophical Collections that Robert Hooke edited. Um, and it has quite a few illustrations, really interesting ones. You can see here a flying instrument. Hang on. Yeah. Flying instrument. So they thought that was a way that you could make people fly. That's right. This is, uh, <laughs> this is a machine to learn how to fly. Do you know what? I think we should make one of these and then test it on James. Well, good luck, James. <laughs> will you jump I off the building <laughs> with one of these, James? <laughs> Maybe only jump from a, a lower floor. I like that moon. The moon is beautiful. This mm. is actually part of an um, astronomical description by Hevelius, and it's a very important description of it. It's the hidden side of the moon, quite obviously, trying to uh, show what's hidden. Ah. So the one article that I want to show you is a little bit later, and it comes with a paper instrument, which I find quite interesting because of what it does. You're meant to cut out those two different parts and then put like the volvel on top of each other and spin it. But this one is meant to actually form a perpetual calendar. So this is what the article actually describes. Supposedly it's a method to actually have an almanac which works perpetually. So you can see how like it looks like a quadrant of a watch so that you can always know when, what day it is. Okay. So it, it relates to the previous one, but I heard it was quite nice to see how several centuries later, they're still using the same methods. They're using the same instruments. They're using paper again. I love it. And it even tells you, you know, put A through B and all this sort of stuff. That's right. so all the instructions are there. There's another thing I think we should get James to test out. Actually, this one, Robert Hooke actually tried that one himself. This is meant to be a scuba diving suit, a diving suit. Oh. And so the Royal Society tasked Robert Hooke to try out a diving suit. And he tries it in the Thames and stays for 20 minutes. So it works. Oh. Basically, it's a big bag of a big bag that you put over your head. Don't try this at home. <laughs> no, don't try this at home. I'm not sure what he's carrying either. It looks like a saw or something. And look at his feet. Yeah, webbed feet to go faster. We have another paper instrument. We have another paper instrument, a very different one, just to show you that all kinds of sciences are using this method of just giving people an easy tool to discover science in general. That's already impressive. Look at that. This is really a rare copy. So there's only a few in the world of this one. Look at the skulls and oh, there's lots going on there. More skulls coming. Do not worry. So you have it actually written memento mori, which is a remember that life is short and remember that you will die. Um, <laughs> this is actually a scientific book from the very early 17th century. Mm, from Slytherin House, I see there with the, <laughs> with the snake. It is a bit Harry Pottery, I suppose, in the yeah. Emblems. Yes, it is. The first version of this is printed in 1713. And in fact, the printer, the engraver of it, steals the drawings of the medical student who actually has come put together this place. And you'll see why it's a medical student who's put it together and prints it without his agreement. And he writes his own name and not the uh, student's name. So he tries to steal um, the book from the author. No. The author, Remelius, goes back and says, no, I'm going to put a better version with text explaining what this is for. Wow. We're talking about the 17th century where it's still taboo to actually look at people and open them up. The church is still against it. And so there's still a taboo in terms of medical schools. So this student thought, well, how can I circulate the knowledge of the body in a way th that people can interact with it without being taboo. So he inserts religious symbols to make it acceptable. And this is Eve and this is Adam. Yep. So we're going to try and cut open Adam and Eve, starting with Eve for no particular reason. So it is quite delicate and you can see there's like the multiple layers. There's m multiple layers for every single one. And uh, the deeper we'll go, the more layers there is. So here you can actually 
lift the top of the spine and look underneath it. Yeah. So it really is like an autopsy and it's also meant to cut out in the same way that you would perform the incisions. And the detail, I think, is really amazing if you think about how much work it would be for the engraver to actually create every single one of those. Yeah. So very, very intricate. I'm sure it's not as difficult as a, an actual surgery, but it is a surgery for paper. And you can see, revealing in the last one, the skeleton. It's amazing, all the little individual muscles on top of muscles. You can see with Adam, you have the intravenous system, you have the muscles, and you have the skeleton again being yeah. revealed. Amazing. You also have individual organs that are presented. So here you have up, your heart, yeah. here you have an eye. Oh, look, and multiple levels of the yes. eye. This is amazing. Amazing. And here you also have a pregnant belly with a little devil, just to tell you that what you're going to look at is frightening. Okay. Is that what it's for? Is that Because yes. you're going into rude places. You're going into rude places, so okay. you want a warning sign. But she also has a little sash, just, yeah. you know, okay. as double measures of protection. Yeah. But you can see inside. Wow. This is crazy. Like when you're growing up as a little kid, you have books that explain how the body works and stuff, but they're never this detailed. I know. This is not the first anatomical flap books, but that's one of the first that is trying to bring medical science to a larger audience. It is meant to give you the tools to do autopsies and open bodies um, at home without the blood, without the mess, and with the church approving of it. I know that one of your jobs here at the Royal Society is like, scanning and digitally preserving all these documents. I have no idea how you are going to digitally preserve this. We're going to try and photograph each flap separately. There will be about 200 single images of all of the flaps open one by one. We're thinking of using small portions of glass that do not quite go on the object itself, but remain above it so that it keeps it open, but still open enough for the camera to go above. Yeah, wish us luck, we'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll try our best. But I'll just show you another couple of, uh, of plates. There are th three plates like this. Nah. So a larger version of Adam. Oh, what's under Adam's sash? I have to see. Revealed another plant. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> yes, it says something about flourishing. So it's the man flourishing. So this one is actually quite difficult because it's got so many layers mm. and you have to open the thorax before flipping. Gosh, it's like surgery. So if you wouldn't mind holding this one open. Perfect. Then I can flip downwards oh. and mm. you can actually see all of the organs. You can actually pull out some of the organs to look at them. There are so many layers that actually wow. with our four hands we don't have enough hands to go deep enough. You so, can so that's his intestines you're pulling that's out? That's his intestine that I can pull out. And you can see how they all have keys as well. So all of the text there refers to the organs and explain how they interact with each other. And you can see here the ribs. Amazing. Gosh. And here you also have the cranium, which I think is one of the most amazing plates because you actually can lift the different hemisphere separately. Oh, it's slicing into different cross sections of the brain. That's right. It's a MRI of the 17th century. Yeah. You can see here the glands, the pituitary gland just down there. Wow. It's got everything. And again, and again, and again. Yeah. But it's, it's many layers every time. What have we got? Well, we've got the lady. And Eve. I love that it's so hardcore science, but they're still prudish about the uh, I know. <laughs> reproductive organs. It's giving you a full view of people, and yet it feels the need to add the sash, mm. and it feels the need to add, you know, the snake as, you know, a sign of a biblical warning mm. at the bottom. It, it is full of symbols. But why I find this to be an amazing paper instrument is because it does give you an access to knowledge in a completely different way than the other instruments where we're looking at, where it's not exactly a do it at home. It's not exactly we're reproducing in paper something that could exist out of copper or wood. This is really an invention that only paper can provide. Do you know what it reminded me of? Playing Operation. Yes, exactly. Yeah. This, is, this is the operation. You could actually play operation because you could <laughs> remove some of the organs there. It's, uh, but I don't think that we will be uh, looked at favorably because this is a very rare book. Wow. <laughs> we have to remember that 
Dissection did not become legal until quite late in the 19th century. One of the popular places for hanging was just around the corner from this house at Charing Cross. And so you could make arrangements, legal arrangements, with the hangman for a few bodies, maybe a year, but the rest you would have to procure from other sources, the so-called resurrectionists, who could give you bodies for anatomy.